All right, Proverbs chapter 3. We'll be continuing this book study in our Sunday school hour. I would, I'd say it's a much needed book, but the same could be said about any book of the Bible. It's all the Word of God, but certainly in a day when this country has pretty much lost its mind and people no longer have the ability to think uh, even about earthly things, let alone sp uh, spiritual or heavenly things, certainly uh, a needed book uh, for us to get the wisdom that God has for us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1, starts out, My son, my son. Now, if you remember from last week, uh, we made the comment that um, you're not getting a book of instruction for so from someone who doesn't care about you. You're not getting a book, book of instruction who doesn't care whether you lived or die or doesn't know who you are. If you're saved, you're God's child, and you're getting this instruction from a father and so the point of the matter is you can trust everything he gives you uh, because God is the great uh, heavenly father. Uh, you, don't, you never have to question if he's going to lead you the wrong way. You never have to question uh, what his motives are in instructing you and teaching you. Uh, if you're saved, you're his child, and you can take 100% uh, what he takes you. You don't have to filter it. You don't have to wonder what his angle is. Uh, praise the Lord. If you're saved, uh, he's, he's going to lead you the right way all the time. My son, forget not my law. Forget not my law. So, if you were with us from the start, chapter 1 lays out two paths, uh, the path of wisdom and the path of the sinner, and says you better choose wisely because one leads to destruction, one leads to everlasting life and joy and peace and contentment. Uh, chapter 2 lays out what it's going to take to get that wisdom. The, uh, it's going to take out a diligence and a work ethic. Like the world goes after money, that's how God expects us to go after knowledge and wisdom. And then chapter 3, the Lord says, now that once you learn it, once you apply it, don't forget it. Because we all have a tendency to forget. We all have a tendency to let things slip. So he says, my son, forget not my law. So you come to church, you hear the word of God preached, you learn it, uh, you even to some measure apply it, but then as you go about your days, you go about your weeks, uh, what happens? Cares of this world come in, and uh, problems come, and trials come, and without even realizing it, you begin to forget what you learned, what you, what you uh, applied and so it starts to slip away and it says, My son, forget not my law. Uh, this world is constantly designed to get your mind off, off the Lord, off the Word of God, off anything that matters and just onto vanity and onto, onto meaningless stuff. And the Lord says, Don't forget what I've taught you. Um, not only are you not su supposed to forget intellectually if someone were to ask you the question, but you're not supposed to forget it when you actually need it. Uh, it's, it's one thing to intellectually know uh, the correct response or the correct answer. It's another thing to remember that in the situation when you need it. And so that's, it comes through a, a consistent walk with the Lord, being spiritually minded and asking the Lord for help. And He can bring, you, bring to your mind those verses at the time when you need them. And that's the idea. It's, it's not just don't forget it like if someone were to ask you a question on a test, could you give the right answer? No, it's don't forget it as you go through your daily life. Uh, my son, forget not my law. And by, by the way, this, this goes also not just for preaching and church, but also for your own Bible reading and study. Uh, don't forget what the Lord's taught you. Don't Whether it's your own Bible reading or your or church service, don't just attend and receive and then don't meditate on it and don't consider it and don't ask the Lord's help regarding it. Uh, you got to continue to meditate on the Word of God and ask the Lord for wisdom and help so that you, you don't forget these things. Um, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of Christians think God's a pushover. I think, um, I think they don't think He's any more 
strict than their boss at work. I'll tell you what I'm. I, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. You 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 have a job at work, and your boss sends you for some kind of training, some in-service training, on-the-job training, and because he wants you to learn some new program, he he wants you to learn some new systems, some new area of the job. He's going to send you to this training. Well. It's, is it enough to say, I attended the training, I was there? Or does your boss expect you to actually learn what he sent you to training for? Uh, after the training, if your boss was to ask you, okay, did you learn it? Did you apply it? Can you now do it? Um, your, res your response of, well, I attended the training, I showed up, isn't that good enough? I don't remember anything I learned. I can't apply it, but I was there, isn't that good enough? And you would say, absolutely not. <laughs> That's not good enough. And yet, many, many Christians say to God, well, I showed up at church, I was there, I checked the block, I read my Bible, and the Lord says, well, have you learned anything? Can, have you started applying anything? Can you, have you actually started doing anything you've learned? Well, no, but I was there, Lord. Isn't that good enough? Well, why do you think the Lord is more of a pushover than your secular boss? <laughs> Why do you think he doesn't expect anything more out of you than your job expects out of you? Uh, the Lord expects us to read his Bible for the purpose of learning it. He expects you to come to church for the purpose of learning something. We're not going through the motions. Everything you do is supposed to be for a purpose. So the Lord says, don't forget it. Learn it and remember it and apply it. Don't forget it. Uh, verse number one, again, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Um, everyone here, I'm sure we understand, especially if you have, if you have, uh, if you have children, we understand that you, your body can keep commandments while your heart is not. <laughs> uh, you can go through the motions and obey what the Lord said and your heart's not in it. And the Lord says, I don't want your, your body should keep commandments, that's true, but I don't want just your body to keep commandments. I want your heart also to keep those commandments. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. The Lord wants us to boldly witness to the lost, right? He wants us to do that. Physically, He wants us to use our tongues, our mouths, to preach to people, tell them about Christ. But you're supposed to do it also with compassion for those sinners and for those lost people. You're not supposed to say, well, I, I obeyed with my body only, but I had no care for the people I was talking to. Your, your heart's supposed to be in this thing, too. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 1 Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars." and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Well, up to this point, everything's good, right? Everything the Lord has to say about the church is good so far. Verse number four, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Well, not something that can be viewed from the outside. It's not a work. That's something the Lord's looking in their heart. And he sees. You're still doing everything you're supposed to from the outside. Nobody could tell any, th any difference. But the Lord says, but I'm looking right into your heart. And I see you've left your first love. Nobody else knows you're not doing anything. Uh, no, uh, nobody else knows you're doing anything wrong. But I know it. I know it. Verse number five. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So this church outwardly was doing nothing wrong. This church, as far as man could see, was top-notch church. And God told them they needed to repent or he'd remove their church. Now, imagine getting, being at this church and receiving this letter and the message from the Lord is you need to repent or I'm done with you. 
repent. Lord, what are we doing? Point to any area of our church. Point to any of area of our ministry. You have nothing bad to say about it. What do you mean we have to repent? And the Lord says, I'm not looking at all that stuff. I'm looking at your heart. You've left your first love. You've, you're still doing everything you used to do, but you don't, you're not doing it for the same reason you used to do it. Uh, all the works are the same, but the heart's gone. And Proverbs 3 says you need to make sure your heart keeps commandments. And when, when you first got saved and you first started serving the Lord, you did that because you loved the Lord. I mean, that was your motivation. Uh, because Jesus saved me, he gave me eternal life, I'm going to give my life for him. Now, as you go through your Christian life and, and, and you get other responsibilities and other things that come upon you and other things you have to do and other things that's required of you, it's very easy sometimes to continue in that motion, but your heart's departed some time ago. And it's a good idea when things get tough and troubles come and trials come and difficulties come, it's a good idea to kind of just step back from that for a moment and, th and ask yourself, why did I start out serving the Lord in the first place? Why did I think it was worth sacrificing my time and my energy and my money in the first place? Why did I think this was a good idea in the first place? And has nothing to do with all those troubles and trials and difficulties. has everything to do with your love for the Lord. And we need, to get, we need to make sure that we never leave that first love. We need, to never, we need to make sure that we never get to the place where we forget why we started serving the Lord in the first place. It's because we loved Him. So make sure, make sure your heart's in it. Uh, go back with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now, there is a good practical application here, but first we have to get the doctrine. There is no New Testament guarantee. This is called rightly dividing. There is no New Testament guarantee that if you live right, you're going to live a long life. Okay, That's Old Testament doctrine for the nation of Israel. We have to get that first. If you don't get that, you're going to get confused. A lot of martyrs gave their lives for Jesus. A lot of God's saints got cut down short. So first of all, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy 4, verse 39. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. A lot of people know that to, at some level, but they don't consider it in their heart. They don't, they don't meditate on it. It has, has no effect on their life. But the Lord said, I want you to know it. I want you to consider it. Verse number 40. Thou shalt keep, therefore, his statutes. Well, if he made everything, who else are you going to listen to? <laughs> Thou shalt keep, therefore, his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. So, under the Old Testament law, promise given to the nation of Israel. If they had kept God's com commandments, if they obeyed God's laws, God promised them long life on the earth. Now you got to get that difference. That's why 2 Timothy 2.15 says, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are no contradictions in the word of God, but there are divisions. The most simple is Old Testament, New Testament. Then It's not all the same. So it was a promise to the nation of Israel that if they obeyed God's commandments, God would prolong their days. But guess what? There still is an application to us today because if you live after the flesh, the Bible says you'll die. That's Romans 8, written in New Testament Christians. So go with me to Romans. Go with me to Romans chapter 6. 
there still is the general application that you and I can apply today as New Testament Christians. I mean, if you, if somebody, not you, it wouldn't be anyone here, but if somebody was to uh, consume alcohol and then get behind the wheel of a car and then crash that car and then wake up in eternity, uh, God's not to blame for that. God didn't do that. Man did that. And God gets blamed for a lot of things man does, but man's always the problem. And uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 6. It's, uh, it's, it's Romans 6 is written to save people, help, uh, telling them how to have victory over sin. Verse number 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Uh, skip down to verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we use verse 23 a lot in witnessing to lost people and we should. But in the context, who is Romans 6 written to? It's written to save people. And God tells saved people, the wages of sin is death. Look at Romans chapter 8. I just, I just referenced it a minute ago, but we'll read the verse. Romans 8 verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, that means you're pursuing the flesh, after the flesh, you're going after it, ye shall die. That's New Testament doctrine for Christians. You go after the flesh, you're going to cut your life short. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, in the, in the verse in Proverbs we just read, it said, if you obey God's commandments, what would he do? He would add length of days, long life, and then what did it say? And peace. And peace. If you're saved... The moment you die, you're going to be with the Lord in heaven. It's not really a great thing to prolong your days upon the earth if you're going to be miserable anyways. <laughs> now, if you're lost, um, you better, better get saved because uh, the worst day on earth is going to be better than the best day in hell, <laughs> if that's such a thing. But if you're saved, did I say that right? If you're saved, the best day on earth is, is worse than the worst day in heaven. Okay, you get what I'm talking about. If you're saved, this is as bad as it will ever be. How's that? If you're lost, this is as good as it will ever be, no matter how good or how bad it is. Okay, so peace. What's the point of prolonging your days if you're going to be miserable anyways, if you're saved? You know, Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, he said, to depart and to be with Christ is far better, right? What did he say? The only reason why I still have uh, some measure of desire to stick around here is because I want to help you. I want to be a benefit to you. Well, if you're just living after the flesh, if you're just living after for yourself, what benefit is that anyways? So go with me to, um, go with me to Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, verse 22. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. What a verse, huh? People, wicked, people live wicked lives, they rebel against God, they have no heart for God, they have no care for God, and then they wonder why they don't have peace. God says, there is no peace unto the wicked, saith the Lord. But what, is the, what does Proverbs 3 say? If you'll obey me, I'll give you long life and peace. And peace. I would like long life, but not just to be miserable. As soon as, I, as soon as I die and go to heaven, I'll be with the Lord. Why would I want to prolong my life if it was, if it was going to be miserable anyways? 
Why would you want to prolong a miserable life when if you're saved, as soon as you die, you're going to be with the Lord? So keep God's commandments, and he won't just lengthen your days. He'll give you a good life while it's being lengthened. That's the idea. Uh, go back with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Now, why would the Lord have to say, don't let mercy and truth forsake you, if it wasn't trying to constantly get away? Don't let it forsake you. Bind it down because it's constantly trying to get away. Now, your desire for mercy for yourself, you don't have to worry about that going away. That's not going away. You're always going to want mercy for yourself. <laughs> but what's, getting, what's going to try to get away from you is your desire to have mercy on others. <laughs> That's what's going to get away from you. We all want mercy for ourselves. We don't have to worry about that going away. Uh, what's going to go away is your willingness to have mercy in somebody else. And it says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. So not just mercy, mercy and truth. And there will, if you are going to cling to truth, if you're going to try to build your life on truth, to obey truth, there will be a constant pressure by the majority of people you, in your life that you come in contact with to compromise on that truth. It will come from the world. It will sadly come from many professing Christians. If you're going to keep truth you're going to have to, it's going to take all your effort and all your power because it's constantly trying to get away from you. Truth in your ministry, truth in your personal life. It's, you're going to have to always keep it, tie it down. It's going to want to go away. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck. Now, mercy and truth are not contradictory. This verse says they go together. So some people want to forsake truth in the name of mercy. So what do you mean? Okay, I'll give you an example. We won't turn there, but 1 Corinthians 5 gives a specific list of sins, not just one. There's a specific list of sins given there for why someone should be put out of the assembly. And someone would say, well, shouldn't we just be merciful to them? Yes, we should be merciful to them in accord with truth. As soon as they are willing to repent... We will gladly have mercy upon them. And the call is, why can't you have mercy? And the Lord says, why can't you obey the truth? And mercy and truth go together. Look at Psalm 85. Psalm 85. Verse number 10. First, Psalm 85, 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So mercy and truth, they're met together. Once you compromise truth to be merciful, you are no longer being scriptural. And you are no longer being like the Lord. The Lord is merciful. More merciful than any of us here this morning. He is also truth. He is also full of truth. He never lies. So... They go together, if, if, if applied properly. Uh, go back with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Again, verse number, th uh, verse number 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Now here's the last phrase. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Now the Old Testament law, Ten Commandments... Or not, uh, was, uh, was written in tables of stone, correct? God wrote it on tables of stone. The Lord says, I want you to get my law. I want you to get mercy and truth. I want you to write it upon the table of your heart. Don't just have it up here, have it down here. You know why? Because it's very easy to say amen to this as long as you're not actually facing it. It's very easy to say, yes, I agree with that as long as currently in your life, you don't, it's not something you're dealing with. But when it touches your heart, when it's someone close to you, when it's 
uh, a situation that you're personally dealing with or with it, where it's a family member or it's a, a friend is involved with, when it really affects you, that's why you need it written in your heart. Because what if it's not in your heart, if, it, if it's only in your head, not in your heart, when that situation comes up, your heart's going to overrule your head. And the Lord says, I don't want mercy and truth just in your mind. I want it in your heart. I want it in your heart. Verse number four. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. God and man. So, Jesus warned that the world would hate you. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. And Jesus said, if they hated me, well, if you're going to follow me, then expect the same, because you're my disciples. They didn't like me being here. They didn't like me giving them the truth. Well, if you're going to represent me, they're not going to like you either. So, but... Because of that, some Christians have made it their life goal to be hated by everyone. And the Lord says, uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, the gospel is an offense on its own. You don't have to add your own offense on top of that. And the Bible says, if you will obey the Lord, if you will let mercy and truth not forsake you, you'll find favor in the sight of God and man. Now, the problem is, when do, when do people lose favor with man? They hang on to truth only and not mercy. In other words, it works like this. If somebody sees that you, to the best of your ability, nobody, nobody does it all 100% right all the time, but if somebody sees you are doing to the best of your ability, you're following the Lord, you're trying to obey the Word of God, you're impartial, you're applying it the same way in all situations, you're doing your best to serve the Lord out of the sincerity of your heart. They may not like it, they may not agree with it, but they have to appreciate it and they will respect it. There will be some favor there because I, it's like, I don't agree with that, I don't like that, I don't want to be a part of it, but I have to admit they're consistent and they're sincere and and the Lord says there will be a measure of favor there, not just from God, but also from man. And the fact that nobody likes you is not a mark of spirituality. It's just a mark of you being arrogant and obnoxious. Um, look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Jesus is uh, uh, 12 years old at this point. It's, uh, he's, uh, this is the end of the passage of him being in the temple and talking with the doctors of the law there. Verse 5, Luke 2, verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, Jesus Christ never compromised on truth one second of his life. But the Bible says he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So it can be done and it should be done. I'll give you one more example. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Also, also a child. Here's, the, here's Samuel as a child. 1 Samuel 2, well, a little context, start in verse 25. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Well, that's a good question. Okay, two men uh, have a problem. Well, there's a judge over them. Well, if you and the Lord have a problem, who's going to judge in that matter? Uh, nobody. If a man shall sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? That's why you need a mediator. That's why you need Jesus Christ, who is God and man. Uh, Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. 
and watch verse 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. So Jesus grew in favor with, uh, with God and man, and, and, and Samuel did as well. And Proverbs chapter 3 says, If you'll obey my words, keep my commandments with your heart, you won't let mercy and truth forsake you, you can do the same. And you ought to do the same. Now go back with me to Proverbs. Verse 5 and 6 are loaded. They're probably all loaded, just haven't seen it all yet, but. Look at verse number 5, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What great verses, huh? What great verses. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. So, again, quick review of what we've learned so far in Proverbs. The Lord says in chapter 1, get wisdom, get knowledge, get understanding. Chapter 2, he says, give all your energy to it. Uh, don't hold anything back in your pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. Give yourself completely to the pursuit of my instruction, my knowledge, my wisdom. Go at it with everything you have. Now, what would be required to, for you to do that? you'd have to have complete confidence in the Lord and what he said that was right. If you didn't have complete confidence in him, you're never going to put that level of energy into it. So what is required to get this knowledge and wisdom? Diligence, yes, but you will never, you will never put that level of effort into it if you're not 100% confident he's right. You're not going to give your whole life. You're not, you're not going to put your life's energy into something you're not sure of. And so the Lord says, you need to trust me. Now, you ever heard the saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket? It, the idea is, you don't know what's going to fail, so kind of spread your resources and don't put it all in one place, because if that fails, everything fails. You know what the Lord says? Well, you know what he says by in, in, these, in these chapters, go after everything I told you. Go after it with all your heart, all your soul, strength, and mind. Trust me with all your heart. You know what the Lord's saying? He says, you can put all your eggs in one basket, and that's me. Because I can't fail. Put your whole life, your whole energy, all your thoughts, all your ideas, everything. He says, put it on me, because I'm trustworthy. I have proved myself in, in eternity and time, and if I prove myself in your life if you give me a chance. And the Lord is so confident that he says, just put it all on me. All your heart, all thine heart. If you trust him with some of your heart, you're going to fail. If you trust him with most of your heart, you're going to come short. The Lord says, trust me with all your heart. Now, nobody else could say that. I couldn't stand up in here. I could not stand up in this pulpit and just say, just trust me with all your heart. Now, you're going to, you're going to, fall, you're going to fail, you're going to fall. No man could say that, but the Lord can say that. The Lord say, anything I tell you, you can trust. Any way I lead you, you can trust. Any place I tell you to go, you can trust. Trust me with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 18 that by two immutable, th <clears throat> immutable things, now a mutation is a change, so if it's immutable, it can't change, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. I'm, I'm glad of that. I'm glad that it's, it's impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who had fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. 
Now Jesus is the anchor of your soul. Whatever storms of life may come, that anchor will never fail. Now if you have cast your entire eternity on Jesus Christ, you've staked your entire eternal soul on Jesus Christ, why don't you just, just go ahead and throw everything else on him too? I mean, that's the most important thing you have, right? This, your soul that's going to spend forever somewhere. If you've put that on Jesus and trusted him to be the anchor, well, Proverbs says, well, how about the rest of your life? You've already trusted me with the salvation of your soul. How about trust me with everything your whole life? And he'll never fail. He'll never let you down. Now go back with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, if you lean on something, you are counting on it to hold you up. Okay, now, if I lean on this pulpit, I am exercising faith and confidence that this pulpit will hold me up. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Lord says, I don't want you to lean on your own understanding. Here, here's, you lean on something that you're confident in, Right? So here's, here's what the Lord's saying. Look, we can, we can sit here in Sunday school and we can learn these truths and we can agree with these truths, but guess what? When it's crunch time, when the real trouble comes, when the real trial comes, when the real situation comes and it's decision time, you are going to lean on what you're confident in. You're not going to lean on what you say you believe. You're not going to lean on what you say you're confident in. That trouble and trial will reveal what you're really, really confident in. And even Christians who say they believe the Bible, a lot of times the trouble comes and it reveals, actually I trust my own understanding more than I trust the Word of God. And the Lord says again, you lean on me, not to your own understanding, you lean on me, I'll never let you fall. I will never fail you. The Lord says, don't lean to your own understanding. Uh, John, in John chapter 13, verse 23, we won't turn there, but it says that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he was leaning on Jesus' breast, right? Now, at, the, at, at that last supper there. Now, he physically was leaning on, his, on, on Jesus. He physically leaning on him. But what a great type and picture of what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to react and act. We're supposed to lean on Jesus, not physically like John did. Obviously, he's not here, but we're supposed to say, you know what, <laughs> Lord, if you fail, I'm failing because all my weight's on you. And the Lord says, I'll never fail you. I never, I'll never fail you. You can lean on me. And then it says in verse 6, Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 6, in all, uh, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he, he, he shall direct thy paths. Now, here's why, here's why, let me go back to verse 5 again, before we get to verse 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own, unto thine own understanding. Here, here's why it's so important to get Bible knowledge. Here's why it's so important to search the scriptures, to go after knowledge and understanding and wisdom with everything you have, okay? Because a lot of people, they think they're trusting the Lord, but they're not trusting the, the Lord. They're, they're trusting their misinterpretation of what he said. They're trusting something he thinks, that, or they think he will do, but something he never said he would do. And so a lot of people lose their confidence in the Lord, not because he failed in anything, not because he didn't deliver in anything he said, but because he didn't meet their expectations. I thought God would do this. Only problem is God never said he would do that. <laughs> so you think God will do this, you think he will act in a certain way, and then when he doesn't do what you thought he would do, you lose your faith in him. But he never said he would do that. You thought he would do that. He never said he would do that. 
So people lose their faith in God, not because God ever failed, but because God failed to meet their expectations. And this is why you need to know what the Bible actually says so you know what you're actually supposed to have confidence in. What am I actually supposed to trust? Not who I think God is, but who God actually says He is. I'll give you an example. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. When people say they've lost their trust in the Lord, what they mean is they've lost, they've lost their trust in an imaginary Lord that doesn't actually exist and the Bible doesn't describe. Well, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, isn't that a great verse? I mean, really, that is a great verse. I'm not being sarcastic. That's a wonderful verse. That's a great promise. Some people have it up on their walls at home or plaques or whatever the case may be, but there's a context to that verse. You can't, you can't just apply that verse without reading what went before it. Look at verse number 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. See that and? It's a, connect, it's a connection. If you obey verse 6, verse 7 is the result. So verse 6, if you're careful for nothing, if you bring everything to God in prayer and you're thankful, you do all that, then you can claim, verse 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you know what people do? Okay, trust the Lord with all thy heart. Okay, I trust you, Lord. Uh, my heart's not being kept. My mind's not being kept. Uh, I'm, I'm troubled. I, I, what you, Lord, you said you keep my heart and my mind. Uh, it's not happening. I lost my faith. You lost your faith because you didn't search the scriptures. You didn't diligently find out what God actually said. You, you, you thought he said something, he never said it. What did he say? He, if you want your hearts and minds to be kept through Christ Jesus, what do you have to do? Number one, be careful for nothing. Don't let care fill you up. So that it pushes out prayer, it pushes out Bible reading, it pushes out obedience. Well, how would you do that? But in everything, not some things, not most things, everything by prayer and supplication. And then, with thanksgiving. <laughs> now, that, that's, that's the part that, tri that trips people up a lot. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So here's what people do. Okay, I'm not going to be careful for it. I'm going to lift my, I'm going to let God make, I'm going to make, let my request be made known unto God. I'm going to bring everything to Him. But in their heart, they're not thankful. In their heart, they really don't believe that God is fair in letting them go through this. In their heart, they really believe they deserve better. So while they're talking to God and they're bringing it to God at the same time, but they're not thankful. And then they don't have peace in their heart and their mind and... And then, Lord, you're failing me. No, the Lord's not failing you. You haven't done what he said to do to get that peace. Now, this is just one example, but you could apply it in a hundred different scenarios. And so when the Lord says, trust in me with all your heart, you have to make sure you're actually trusting what he said, not what you think he said. You're actually, you have to make sure you're trusting him, not who you think he is. So what's the end result of not diligently searching the scriptures? You lose your peace because of a lack of Bible knowledge. And you lose your confidence in the Lord because you think the Lord said something he didn't say. So the Lord said, I want you to trust me with all your heart. <laughs> but in order for you to trust me, you have to know what I actually said. And in order to know that, you'd actually have to search the scriptures diligently. Go back with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. We're out of time, but I, I have to finish this. I, I can't leave this, break it up, leave it till next week. We're almost done. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 6. 
in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. All right? So here's what people do. Okay, there I'm faced with a situation. I'm faced with a circumstance. I don't know what to do. Okay, Lord, I'm acknowledging you in this situation. Now please direct my paths. Is that what the verse said? No, it says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Lord, the Lord is not sitting up in heaven waiting for you to decide when you want his guidance and when you don't. Lord, I'll handle this situation on my own, but direct me here. Show me the way here, but I got this covered. Lord says, when you want to be directed, let me know. When you want, to, when you want me to show you, show you the way, let me know. As long as you're picking and choosing, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll take your guidance here, but not over here. Don't tell me what to do over here, but tell me to do what to do here. The Lord says, no. When you want me to tell you what to do, let me know, and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what to do. I'll guide your path. The promise is not if you acknowledge him in a certain situation, he'll guide you. The promise is if you're acknowledging him in everything, he'll guide you. That's the promise. Go with me to Psalm 37. Almost done. Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now, if the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, what should you be focused on? Directing your steps or being a good man? If you let the Lord make you good, you don't have to worry about the steps because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So if you allow the Lord to make you good, the steps will be ordered right. But what people do is they don't focus on allowing the Lord to change them and make them a good man or, or a good woman, as the case may be, but they instead focus on getting the right steps. The Lord said, Don't worry about the steps. You be a good man and the steps will follow. One more verse, Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We don't have the ability to take the right steps in life. So what do you have to do? You have to trust the Lord and obey the Lord, and he will guide you. Now, does the Lord ever go the wrong way? No, he doesn't. So then guess what? You don't have to worry about what the right way is and the wrong way is. You just have to follow him. Because if you're following him, you'll never be going the wrong way because he never goes the wrong way. So you follow the Lord, you trust him, and he'll direct your steps. 